Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. Tonight, we take you back to the early days of broadcasting. We have an interview with Norm Davis, who worked at WRUF in Gainesville and WJXT-TV4 in Jacksonville. Norm played a key role in the journalism that helped bring us Jacksonville's consolidated government. Here's our interview. It started in high school. I <coughs> finished high school in Palatka. And it worked out that in my senior year of high school, I only had to go to school for three hours a day because in the prior years, I had accumulated some extra credits by taking extra courses. So I had a half a day free in my senior year of high school. And I became involved with a local radio station in Palatka and as a uh, sort of a part-timer, but I was doing all kinds of things on the air. I was a disc jockey and I was reading rip and read news and, and, and doing baseball broadcasts and all of that. And how did you get that job? I just went down and knocked on the door. And, and they I put had, you in front of a microphone. Yes, they did. <laughs> well, it was a very small market and a very small radio station. And they weren't looking for, you know, people with lots of uh, experience and, and, and that sort of thing. And so, to my surprise, they just took me in and put me on the air. And I was there for a full year. And you did a little bit of everything, including yes. sweeping out and... <laughs> yes, all of the above. <laughs> right. And I, then a, a, an amazing thing happened that prolonged my, that really put me on the road in broadcasting. Uh, in Palatka on Sunday afternoons. This was a daytime radio station, by the way. It was only sunrise to sunset. 250 watts. 250 watt station, not very big. But on Sunday afternoons, we would broadcast uh, the local professional baseball game in the Florida State League. And I was tapped to go out to the baseball stadium and do the play-by-play, -play, and I did. This was the Palatka, what? I, th I, Eagles or? I think it was, <laughs> uh, I think it was the Palatka Azaleas or something okay. like that. <laughs> right. I don't remember the name actually. But I was broadcasting one day, and uh, the man who was the general manager of a much larger radio station in Gainesville, uh, WRUF was passing through Palatka that afternoon and listened on the radio and heard the broadcast. And on the following day, Monday, he called me from Gainesville, told me he was a retired Army major who was running that station in Gainesville. And he asked me, uh, are you planning to go to college? And I said, I don't have any plans, because I didn't. I did quite well in high school grade-wise, but I simply didn't have uh, the, the motivational support in, in my home setting to encourage me to go to college. I said I would think about it. He said, why don't you come over and talk to me? So I did. I went to Gainesville and met him. He was a gruff, uh, retired Army major. And we talked for quite a while. And he said, well, let's, uh, let's go do an audition. And so they took me into a very, very large studio at that radio station in, in Gainesville, and I did an audition. And it was sort of a standard event. They handed me some scripts, you know, to read uh, news copy and to read uh, two or three commercials and some other uh, material. And then a voice over the box told me to put the papers down, please. And the, the, the voice, uh, these were people in the control room who were watching and, and this, this uh, process. Uh, the man said, I'm going to give you uh, a topic in just a second, and I'd like to have you just talk uh, freely uh, and tell us everything you know about the safety pin. So I started talking about the safety pin, and I just made up all kinds of things. Uh, about its history, its appearance, its materials, its use in war. And, and how long did this go on? It, Fifteen minutes later, <laughs> this voice came over the box and said, thank you very much, that'll do. <laughs> Enough of that already. Because I was still going on. So they, they told me, I would, that would, and they offered me a job. And what that demonstrated was that I could ad lib, like I'm doing now. But I took that job, and I was in, I, 
I did, did move to Gainesville, enrolled in the University of Florida, a, a landmark event in my life to say the least. And I worked for that station for four and a half years. For two years uh, in my junior and senior years in, in college, uh, I was uh, uh, helping in the broadcast of the University of Florida football game. With Otis Boggs. With Otis Boggs. Otis did the play-by-play, -play and I did what was then called the color. And we traveled with the, the team wherever it went. Went to Los Angeles twice and, and lots of other places and did broadcasts. In those days, there was no television. And th it, those were the days before there was a national championship, needless to say, needless or an say. SEC championship. Correct. Even. But uh, there was no television, so radio was a, was a big vehicle at that time. And Florida, the, the Florida Football Network has everybody listened to that. 65 stations scattered throughout the state. Yeah. And everybody listened. And so we had a huge audience. One time, we were up in Auburn doing a game, and Otis became ill right after we went on the air for the game. And a timeout occurred, and he got up from his seat and said, I can't do this anymore. Come over here. <laughs> and so I moved over into his seat and put on his microphone and did my first big-time football play-by-play -play. and actually did a pretty good job, I think. I had to do the play-by-play the, the -play -play and all the, everything else. I had to do the, the halftime discussions, and I was exhausted at the end of the broadcast. But uh, I, I enjoyed that, actually. Well, uh, so you continued at WRUF and uh, graduated yes. University of Florida. With a degree in journalism. One of the things I did, by the way, in the journalism school was, at that time, journalism was concentrated entirely on print, newspapers and magazines. And the dean of the journalism school was, at that time, a, a man named Ray Weimer. Right. And I began to talk with him about, why don't we... Why don't, why don't we change the curriculum to include some radio news uh, training? And he did. And he began to develop a broadcast aspect of the journalism program at the university. And now it's a full-fledged part now of the it's school. A, it's a full-fledged telecommunications yeah. uh, school instead of mere journalism. Well, at some point you uh, ended up in Jacksonville. Yes, when I finished... Uh, at, at the University of Florida, I had to go in the Air Force for two years as an ROTC uh, commitment. I went in as an officer, and I was stationed for a year in Alaska and a year in Texas. And at the conclusion of the two years, I had planned to return to Gainesville. They wanted me to come back, and even though I was going to be no longer a student, to work for the radio station again, WRUF. So I was headed back to Gainesville and actually stopped by and talked to the general manager and others, and I was getting settled and getting relocated out of the Air Force. But at that time, I became aware for the first time of television. And I began to watch, for the first time, broadcasts out of Jacksonville on, on what was uh, then WMBR-TV. And uh, I learned that some of the people I had known at the University of Florida were up at that television station in various positions. And I uh, put in a call to a, a fellow who had worked in the, at the radio station in Gainesville and was at that time the program director of Channel 4 in Jacksonville. And I arranged a meeting with him, came up to Jacksonville, and uh, we talked about a job. I had obviously no television experience at all. So he set me up in the studio for an audition in front of a camera. You didn't talk about safety pins no, again. No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they had some commercials that I read and some other materials, and it was a fairly short audition, and they offered me a job. By the time I got to Channel 4, which was in 1954, the station had been on the air for uh, three or four years and had developed a, 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 a set of systems and it, it was, it was operate, operating quite well by the time I arrived. And there was certainly no news department. Uh, and so I was just an announcer. And where was the TV station? Well, it was a, when I first uh, joined the station, it was located at the uh, south end of the Main Street Bridge, right close to the water. In a Quonset hut. 
Well, the transmitter was in a Quonset oh, hut, okay. but the studios were in a building very ad adjoining that roadway, right at the, at the foot of the bridge. And the big sign up on the building was WMBR-TV. And it was a good-sized building because we had a, a, a large studio. And there was also a radio operation in there at the time, WMBR Radio. So the, both the radio and TV operations were in the same location. But the transmitter was not far away, as you say, in a Quonset hut out on the south side. And then after about uh, a year and a half or so, maybe two years, the station was purchased by the Washington Post Company. And the Post uh, kept the same management in place. Glenn Marshall was the general manager for some time. They changed the, the call letters to WJXT. And they also changed the location. They built a new building out farther on the south side. And the entire operation was, and a new tower was built out there as well, which is still there. And then the whole operation was moved to that much, much larger, much more sophisticated place. This was a, an era of live television. There was no such thing as videotape. Correct. Uh, so talk, talk about that. There were a lot of local programs because yes. there was a limited amount of network programming, I guess. Yes. Yes, live television is a special animal. Uh, there was no videotape until, I think, maybe the middle part of the 1960s. So everything else that we did was live. And when you're live and something wrong happens, all you can do is go straight ahead. And as you said, there was a, a good amount of local programming, entertainment programming, um, musical programming, uh, uh, country music. There was a, 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 a band headed by a man named Toby Doughty. Mm -hmm. And it was, he had a popular show in prime time, prime time being from 7 or 8 o'clock p.m. up to 11 or 11.30. So in doing those kinds of live programs, because they were production-wise uh, more complex than, than usual, there had to be an adequate amount of time to rehearse and not only rehearse the performers, but rehearse the cameras and rehearse the people handling the microphones, which at that time were not like these. They were on, on, uh, on pedestals and, and you could swing them around. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it, it worked. It wasn't perfect. The this, this station at that time had some very fine directors. The directors were the people who in the control room were directing the production and go here and do that, pan left, pan down, and, and controlling the lighting and everything. Uh, the most prominent director we had at the time was a man named Windsor Bissell. And Windsor, when he would go out and, and rehearse these programs before they went on the air, I used to admire watching him do that. He was so smooth and so talented. He would get everything in place. And then when the program went on the air, all these things he had set up and arranged would fall into place and, and in a very natural, smooth way. It was very good. It was interesting to watch. Commercials were live. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And, uh, and, and people weren't as fastidious about separating. Uh, there would be a news anchor with a product on the desk yes. in front of him. Yes. So there wasn't quite as much separation between uh, advertisers and well, let's talk, about, let's talk about those news broadcasts, because in those days, there was no news department. In the 1950s, there was no news department. But there was a news program. CBS had a 15-minute news program every evening from 6 to 6.15. Douglas Edwards. Douglas Edwards. And at 6.15 to 6.30 was the Channel 4 news block. So there was five minutes of news, five minutes of weather, five minutes of sports. And the news at that time was, as much as anything, taken off the, uh, the tickers, the United Press and the Associated Press. And occasionally, there would be uh, some useful piece of local news that would weave its way into the production. But it was, it was superficial news, because that's all we could do with the resources that we had. And that's why, as 1960 approached, 
there was some serious thinking going on about improving that by establishing an actual professional news department. And as I've mentioned before, in 1960, that took place. And uh, the, the key person there that we want to acknowledge would be Bill Grove, uh, a legendary figure in local. I could not say too much about Bill Grove. Bill uh, had no television experience when he came there. What did he do before? He was a teacher in Pennsylvania. And he taught, as I recall it, for several years. And for reasons I, I don't remember, he moved down to, South Flo to, to Jacksonville and uh, had his family here with him. But he became legendary, as you say. Bill, when we formed the news organization, Bill was quite pleased that I was eager to join and take part in that. And together, we really structured the, the, the place. And he was a... A, a very strong and effective leader. He also was a very effective man on the air. He anchored all of the news programs, particularly the ones at 6 o'clock, because by that time we had extended the 15-minute block to a 30-minute block. And he, he did for a while, for a short while, he did the 6 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news, but that changed, and he began to assign other people to, to handle the anchor job on the 11 o'clock broadcast. You're watching an interview with Norm Davis, TV journalist, on the early days of broadcasting. More of our interview after this. <laughs> 